So yeah, once again, my name is Malte, I'm the CTO of Vercel, and today I really, really realized how much of a bubble I live in. So I live in Silicon Valley now, I'm originally from Germany, in the, but it's been 12 years, and if I go to a conference in Silicon Valley right now, there wouldn't have been like eight talks for the first one about AI to happen. Um, so it's very interesting. I also love this morning, it was very much reminiscent of old times. I love that we're back to having conferences. I heard Jess talk about CGI in the 90s, and I was like, that's what I did. I used to FTP to prod. Um, I heard Minko talk about Wiz, which I actually created at Google uh, a very long time ago, 12, 14 years, something like that. Um, and it's amazing to see that kind of have another life. All right. But today I want to talk about AI and how it's going to change software, both for developers and end users. As an end user, you're probably like on ChatGPT, you're seeing all these things happening. As a developer, maybe you're using Copilot, maybe you are going to ChatGPT to learn Rust or to learn Bash, what it's, what's what I'm doing. It's definitely happening, right? There is something going on in the world. And the way we kind of started thinking about this is this transition from software 1.0 to 2.0. We used to do machine learning, and now we're doing AI, because machine learning was like this university PhD thing where you were doing Python, but you know, now we're building applications, we're doing that in TypeScript. It used to be back-end first because it was all about making it work, but now it's front-end first because it's about the applications. And because you actually had to build the science, you had to make do it yourself, or you do machine learning ops, it was difficult, right? Now, what you can do is you call a model as a service, just an API call, everyone can do it. Models were small, now they're very large, they're very smart. You can handle them very, very easily. You didn't even have a model, you had to thought, think about training first. Now models are getting so good that it's not even clear that fine tuning is going to be a thing. It might be, right, like we're literally figuring that out, but you can get very far by just prompting the thing. We used to ship research papers, now we're shipping, shipping products, right? We used to ship over years, and certain things can now be done in days. And there were like few of us, and now everyone can be an AI developer, which is very exciting. And all of this is embedded in this like change of velocity of AI development, and we're kind of still in the early days. We're what I would call the GPT-4 era, um, and obviously stuff is going to happen in the future, and I think the good bet to make is that the AI is going to be smarter, but that's good for us because we can, we can exploit that, and I'm going to talk about how that works. And what's also really interesting is that, sure, this kind of started with OpenAI, but now uh, we have Google's Gemini, we have Cloud, which is amazing. Um, got a name drop, Mistral, incredible company here from France and, and, and wider Europe. Very impressive what they're doing. So there's like this diversity of tools that is getting really, really good, and we can take advantage of it. And, but we do need to acknowledge that if there is disruption, we need to find like a place for ourselves. Like the world's changing, and like what, is, what, is, what does it mean for us, right? What do we, what is it, what's our place in this world? And, and, and what I want to do in this talk is I want, to, I want this to come across as a positive message because I have an answer for this question. And I hope you agree with it or at least it, it helps you proceed on your path. So let's baseline ourselves. I was told to baseline myself on stage as well, so I'm going to do this. We identify maybe as React developers. I think that's probably true for many of us here, right? Maybe you self-identify as front-end engineers. But maybe we also you know, already count ourselves an AI engineer, but we're somewhere on that spectrum, right? And so what are we going to be in the future? But let's, let's, while we're baselining ourselves, let's baselining ourselves with the state of the art of AI. And I'm going to torture you guys. Um, imagine we have this chat. Imagine you're an engineer on an airline application right? And, and you're tasked to build this chat application that lets users interact with your airline product, right? And the user comes around and says, I would like to change my seat selection to a window seat. And again, we're talking state-of-the-art UX here. AI comes back and says, absolutely, no problem. Would you like to sit in 14C, 17D, 19C, 19D, 20C, 
20D, 21C, 37C, 38D, 39C. Any, any, any takers? Great. <laughs> so you're like, you're completely overwhelmed, and you say like, well, just give me something that's far away from the laboratory, right? So AI comes back and says, all right, cool, that narrows it down to 14C, 20C, 20D, 21C, 37C, 38D, 39C. Cool. Let's leave it at that, right? But that's, like, you can imagine having this, com this conversation. What if instead this had happened? Right? You talk to the AI text, I want to change my seat, and the AI says, sure, here's a seat map, and I pre-selected a seat for you. It's a window seat like you wished for, but you can now see it in context. You see which other seats are open. You can make a change. You don't need to talk to me for that because probably you're better on your, with your hands or your voice or whatever, right? Um, so that would be so much better, right? Like, it's not like just because there's now AI doesn't mean that text is the right modality. And so from that, I think, follows I have two insights. But first of all, text isn't the right UI modality for many tasks. Again, we were seeing how, how much nicer it is to have UI instead of text. And from that follows that AI still needs front-end engineering, right? So there seems to be a spot for us. And then insight number two, all those UIs we've already built still have a place in the future of AI-supported human computer interaction, right? We've, our airline already has a seat map, right? Like, we don't need to make a new one just because we're now in AI land. And so, only question is, how do we teach the AI about our UI? I want to answer that question. For that, we will need to look at some code. That's cool, we're all developers. Um, I'm going to teach you how to call in AI. You haven't done this before. Um, this is an example using the cell AI SDK. It's very easy. You import this function called generate text. You tell it what model you want, give it a prompt, what is love, and it gives you text back. Right? That's it. There's no, there's no part two. That's how easy it is to call an AI. But obviously, now we're, we're still in text land, right? Like, this is not what we wanted. This is what gives us the 14C, 17D, whatever experience. All right, we need to go one level deeper of what modern LLMs can do. They have a notion of function calling or tool calling, and the picture to have in your hand is you're like this cave person, and you discover that the stone is really good at like opening the fruit, right? Like, and you're suddenly better at your life because now you can eat the coconut, and you couldn't, right? That's amazing, right? And similarly, AIs don't know what the weather is in Paris right now, but if they, you could give them a tool to find out that would be very smart. And so the way this actually works in practice is that you can actually give LLMs a function that you wrote in JavaScript, which you already know how to do, and it will call that function to get some info, to make a change, something like that, right? So once again, um, same example as before, but now like with a little bit more magic. It's using a library called Zot, which is like a TypeScript runtime type thing. Um, not so important, right? But now we, have, we still have the generate text function. We provide a tool to our AI called getWeather. Um, we describe the par parameters we know we need, like the location where the weather is, right? And then we provide a function called execute for how to figure out the weather. In this case, it's calling math random, but you, know, you, you would figure out how to do this for real, right? You could just write whatever thing you did. And then the prompt is, what is the weather in Paris and what attraction should I visit? The AI is like, I don't know where the weather is, but I was provided the getWeather tool I'm going to call it and figure out the weather, right? It's easy as that. All right, cool. Very important slides now. LMs can call your JavaScript functions. Good. React components are just JavaScript functions. And it's like, Poof, right? Like, what if the AI could call your React components? Wouldn't that be, wouldn't that be awesome? Right? Exactly. So back to the example. Now, this is the code that you already saw. Nothing changed about this code. I'm just going to put it here so I can show a diff. We all love diffs, right? Here's the new code. So I changed the generate text function to the stream UI function. I provided like this text renderer that's not so important that 
return some JSX for how to render the content. But the most important thing is that we now have a generate function here and has some like magic with generators, CC Ben, um, for showing loading components. But really, it just calls us like get weather API, and then it renders the weather component. And that weather component, that's just, an a, that's just a real component. Like, you already know how to do that, right? Like, that's all there is to it, right? It's, it's, it's as simple as that. Very cool. So that's how suddenly the AI can call the React component. And that weather component can do whatever you like. Whatever you like as a front engineer. Cool. Obviously, this is kind of boring, so I'm going to try to show you guys a demo. There we go. So this is a chatbot, and it actually knows stuff about airlines. And thanks for the demo, guys. This actually works. So all right, OK, I actually, I would like to fly to Paris. Just to show you kind of that this is like not completely fake. It's actually completely fake. You see that it's the same flights. But it did, that did figure out that CDG is the right yada code for the Paris airport, right? So I can interact with this. But it's not just that this list of flights it's not a bunch of text. It's a real component, right? Like, I can, I can actually select it. I can select a flight. And there it is. There's my, there's my seat map, right? Cool. So I select a seat. Offers me proceed to checkout. Let's buy it. One, two, three, four, five. There you go. I even get a boarding pass. Very cool. And once again, this is just React. So if we go back here, I actually have the code on the site, right? And if you look at this project, you know, it's like a normal React project. There's nothing weird about this. Like there's boarding pass, the TSX, the slides of TSX. This is the thing here. I can oops. BG dash green. It's just a nice one. Safe. OK, here's where the demo gets. Forgive me. It should have HMR'd. Why does it not HMR? OK, whatever. That's all right. But it's just a real component, right? Like, it, there's literally a living React application on my local host. Very cool. You can all imagine HMR, right? It's the best thing since sliced bad. So um, you understand almost everything about this except one thing. Um, and, and it's not a complicated concept. So once again, how does it work? I have my LLM, my large language model, and it has these capabilities of calling these AI functions. Those AI functions are technically React server components, but that doesn't really matter. Like, it, it's not important. It's just because React comp server component can stream over the network. They're really good for something that the server tells us, right? But the React server component can just contain React client components, which is maybe what you're more familiar with. And it's actually really important because we want to change stuff, right? The seat map is obviously a React client component because we want to you know, make selections, right? And in React, you have this concept of state, right? You select the state, and you're going to you know, change some state. Now, the AI doesn't know about that selection, right? That's because, and that's why the AI SDK has this notion of AI state, where you basically have a second setter that you, can, that you call, and whenever you call it, it actually calls back to the AI and tells it, user selected seat 19C, right? And that's it. That's how you can connect these applications in a very, very simple manner. Some more concrete use cases, right? We were showing basically like an end user chat interface. It's obviously something you might be tasked to do, right? What's really popular now is giving support teams access to these chatbots that have you know, the knowledge of the entire company. And you could imagine giving these the real components that these support people can actually make changes or get data in the context of your business in a very simple manner. Right? One use case that we're really definitely seeing a lot are search engines. There's a really, really cool open source project called Warfic that is a, effectively like a perplexity clone, um, perplexity search engine clone. In, in full-blown fashion that you can download and, and, and get started with. But also, like, you probably, maybe you're working for an e-commerce company, right? And your e-commerce company has a product search engine, 
And that product search engine already has a component that knows how to draw the products. Everything about it is great, right? You can add a little bit of interactivity where maybe you can be more interactive, where you can tell the, the, the shop, you know, but my size is X, and it kind of knows what to do, but you can use those existing components. And then I think there are really interesting applications in, for example, accessibility. So imagine you actually don't change anything about your existing web applications, except that you add this notion of AI state and make your entire web app something you can talk to, so that people who don't know how to push a mouse around or, or use a touchpad can just talk to the website. And that was, that's a thing that probably would have been like very futuristic a couple years ago, and now it's a project that you can absolutely do. All right. So back to the big question, right? There's a disruption. AI is happening. What does it mean for us as, as front engineers, as JavaScript engineers? Think about AI as the new backend, right? You used to call some, some API server API to get the data that you're showing on your web application. Now you're calling API. It's not particularly new. You can still do it. Human-computer interaction is actually more important than ever, right? Like, it's not, like, just because we can now chat doesn't mean that text is the right modality, right? Like, we need to invent new ways of communicating with computers. And then finally, front-end is evolving, and that's obviously, like, you know, so many jokes were made about this today. It's obviously always true. But it also becomes the main source of product differentiation. Right? So if you have these incredibly powerful AIs being made available as APIs by those companies I'm, I, I named, right? by OpenAI, by Google, by Anthropic, by Mistral, right? if you have those, you don't need necessarily to like, have a humongous amount of logic on top of them. But the stuff that's important for your business will still be important. And the way you present it, because everyone's on the same AI, might become actually very, very important. So it actually uplifts the importance of the front end part of the stack. So hopefully that kind of answers this question, right? There is a disruption. What's our place in it? Our place is that we still build user interfaces, but they're in a new context. They're in the context of AI. So how do you do it? Um, I was showing examples from the Vercel AI SDK. Um, there's documentation. Um, probably actually better is to go to the examples and check them out. That's the one I was showing and more stuff, right? And it gives you a working chatbot that knows how to put React components into them, and you can go in there and like switch out the list flight components against the one that your business wants, right? And so you can get into like a working state really, really quickly, which I love, right? And then you can learn the concepts from there. That's all I had today. Thank you very much, and have a great night.